Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Andrew Bradley, Dale Mulcahy, and Matt Zaglin. Coming up on DTNS, is the age of brain-computer interfaces upon us? Plus, Google cracks down on productivity, and Nika Monfort highlights how bees helped one entrepreneur build a better supercomputer. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 1st, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Nika Monfort. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have bees to get to, as as well as brains, uh, but no brain surgery, at least in one case. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Not that one, that one. Apple added Apple Pay web support for third-party browsers in the latest iOS 16 beta. Developers confirmed Apple Pay works in Chrome, Edge, and Firefox browsers on iOS. The register points out that this may be a response to draft le- legislation in the EU's upcoming Digital Markets Act. Last week, Elon Musk filed a confidential countersuit against Twitter in the Delaware Court of Chancery. Uh, that's where Twitter is suing Elon Musk. The countersuit is not public, but a version could be pl- published Uh, with the sensitive details redacted. Also, Twitter investor Luigi Crispo filed a proposed class action lawsuit against Musk for alleged breach of contract and breach of fiduciary duty to Twitter's shareholders. Twitter's lawsuit against Musk over the deal is scheduled to begin October 17th. So not at all messy, as expected. Tim Hortons reached a proposed settlement in four class action lawsuits in Canada over accusations that it used its mobile app to frequently collect sensitive location data on users. The fast food chain would offer impacted users a free hot beverage and baked goods worth roughly nine Canadian dollars, as well as permanently deleting the data. The settlement still needs court approval. Also won't be messy. Nobody's going to mind, right? Nope. Nope. Uh, Nope. The Economic Times of India's sources say that the Indian food delivery service Zomato, a name that I have to say I really like, plans to rebrand itself as Eternal. The rebranded company would include its subsidiaries Blinkit, Hyperpure, and Feeding India. Those would act as peers under a single organization under CEO Dipinder Goyal. Let's hope it remains Eternal, or that's a terrible name. <laughs> Twitter began testing a way to get more app usage from people who say, eh, Am I really ready to sign up for Twitter? This will let people use the service without an account with a feature called Try Twitter. It's offering limited functionality to some users on iOS, which lets them read tweets, follow up to 50 users, and also get notifications. So it's limited usage, but still Twitter usage. Product manager Laura Burkhauser said that the idea is to allow users to get the Twitter timeline experience without the extra step of account creation. Uh, Genius and about 10 years too late. Like, you know, if Twitter is a place where people follow stuff, make the following easy. They should have know, done this right? Time. Yeah, yeah. Let's limit your usage so you get used <laughs> to us. All right. Uh, let's talk a little more about the brain. Let's do it. So Wired's Grace Brown has an article up called The Age of Brain-Computer Interfaces is on the Horizon. Brain-Computer Interfaces, or BCI, generally means a device that reads signals from the brain and then uses those signals to trigger actions like moving a robotic arm or controlling a cursor on a screen. The devices don't read minds as much as they're detecting unique signals and then learning how to interpret them so the person gets the thing they want to get done done takes training on the algorithmic side and also the patient side so tom what is the new news here on july 6th the company called synchron successfully implanted its bci in a patient in new york it's the company's first implementation in the united states synchron is one of two bci devices approved in the u.s for implantation the other is the utah array from blackrock neurotech That one requires brain surgery. They open up your head and stick electrodes into the brain material itself. Synchron's device is less invasive. It's a mesh about the size of a AAA battery, so so pretty pretty small. You implant that through the veins, uh, so you go in through the jugular and up into the brain's veins, requiring no cutting into the skull. The mesh then nests in the wall of the blood vessels in the brain where it can receive the signals. Now... That sounds complicated, I know, uh, but it's still less risky than opening up the skull and doing actual brain surgery. Synchron surgery 
will let you go home the same day as implementation as implantation. I guess it's implementation of the of implant. the implantation. The implantation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Synchron's devices uh, implanted in four patients in Australia over the past year and indicated prolonged use was safe. You might have heard Tom's uh, description and saying, this doesn't sound safe at all. Well, indications are that it is. The implantation in New York is the beginning of safety and feasibility studies to see how well this can work with different people. Synchron hopes to have it implanted in 15 people by the end of this year. They also want to find out if it improves a patient's life. If it does, the company can apply for FDA approval to make it available under Medicare. The next step after that might be wider commercial availability for non-medically necessary reasons. And with that comes quite a few ethical considerations. For example, who owns the data on your brain? If it's collected, where does it go? If a company goes out of business or gets bought or just ends support for some sort of device that you have used or you may use in the future, it might be in your brain. So who pays to get it removed or updated? Yeah, uh, these are starting to become practical questions, not just uh, academic questions, because if you noticed, we said it was Synchron's first U.S. implantation. Not the first U.S. implantation at all. Uh, not Synchron's first implantation. Uh, Sarah just mentioned they did four in Australia. So there are other folks with other BCIs implanted. Uh, one of those people is Ian Burkhart, paralyzed from the chest down, who uses a BCI to control muscle stimulation to restore finger and wrist movements. He leads the BCI Pioneers Coalition of BCI users sharing their experiences and advocating for safe development. So they're trying to say, we need these. We need them to be done safely. And if they're done safely, then we can get more of them and get more advances on them. Uh, the group wants to establish, quote, best practices for future patients, clinicians, and commercial entities engaging with BCI research. Because I imagine there's more than one of you that shuddered a bit at one part or another of this story, and yet it's life-changing for the people who have it. Uh, Nika, what do you make of this? That's exactly what I was thinking. For me, I would probably not want to get this because, again, tons of ethical issues, um, health issues. But for people like Ian, this is a, a life altering you know, type of technology. So I would probably say for um, extreme cases or or cases where, you know, improvement and quality of life is significant, then this is probably something that that people in those situation, situations will be probably more open to than just, you know, uh, someone who has functioning, you know, limbs and body parts and, and are just, you know, not encumbered by any type of, of health issues. I mean, as somebody who's had some brain issues in the past, I've never, you know, had had really limited mobility, but definitely brain triggering um, unwanted actions in the rest of my body. Um, I I feel like if I was a candidate for something like this and I felt confident enough that my life could be improved on the other side of it, I'd be really interested. But yes, this whole kind of the ethics of who has the data? What could the data mean for anything that I could do in the future if I got put into some sort of category with other people who had enough of the same, I don't know, neuron activity that I did, uh, whether or not, you know, that was, uh, you know, known to me or something that could negatively impact me in the future? All very important questions that I just don't think we have the answers to yet. Yeah. And, and I could see uh, a tech backlash against this, reducing the usefulness of it, uh, put, putting too many restrictions on it that make it harder for the people who do need it to get it. That's why I was fascinated to find out that BCI pioneers existed and is a very small number of people, but very uh, organized and active to say, let's do the right thing with this technology from the beginning. Uh, I think that that is unusual to see that level of organization around something. And that could lead to a safer implementation of the implantation later on down the road that lets us have less medically necessary things that are also le less invasive than even the Synchron one that we were talking mm -hmm. about that could provide some 
enhancement to life that is not as problematic both on the you know like having to be surgery maybe it could be on the outside uh we have examples of that where it can just you know skull caps it's on the brain but more importantly having pioneered the ethics from the beginning i mean that'll be the biggest legacy of bci pioneers i think for sure and starting on the health end rather than on the vanity end Mm -hmm. i think is also a huge uh benefit as well Well, folks, if you hear a decades-old song all of a sudden appearing on the Billboard charts, it usually means one of two things. Either a new season of Stranger Things has dropped, congratulations, Kate Bush, uh, or the song blew up on TikTok, or possibly both. Uh, By design, TikTok is already very much a music discovery platform. It was was built partly on the bones of Musical.ly. But it looks like, Sarah, it might be trying to expand that role a little more. Indeed. Insider reports that ByteDance filed a trademark application for TikTok music in Australia, followed by an application with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office on May 9th, listing a service that would let users, quote, purchase, play, share, download music, songs, albums, lyrics, live stream audio and video, edit and upload photographs as the cover of playlists and comment on music, songs and albums. Now, a lot of this is already done on TikTok, but not in much of an official sense. Other use cases include live stream audio and video interactive media programming in the field of entertainment, fashion, sports, and current events. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I think I live in India and I know ByteDance is a big giant company that already owns a music streaming app here. And you're right. That those of you who thought that uh, it launched music streaming app Reso in 2020. That's spelled R E S S O. It's available not only in India but in Brazil and Indonesia as well. It's not clear if TikTok music would be built on Reso's platform or not. They might. They might not. Uh, but if you look at the implementation of Reso in Brazil, TikTok redirects users to full songs on Reso if they want to find out more about them. That certainly seems like a likely integration for TikTok music. Reso has licensing deals with Sony Music Entertainment, Warner Music Group, Merlin, and Beggars Group. It does not have a deal with UMG, Universal Music, at least not yet. Now, TikTok does. They just couldn't get it for Reso. So... I, I I look at this and I think a few things. One is I used to use Shazam with Google Music before Apple owned Shazam. Uh, and it was always difficult to get the song I recognized in uh, Shazam to open up in Google Music. But I could do it. Uh, it was easier once I switched to Apple Music, even before Apple owned Shazam, to get something to open up in Apple Music. They just, they implemented it better. I could see TikTok being able to take advantage of that and say, hey, wouldn't you like to have this TikTok music service? The key is it's going to have to be really easy to use. Like you could should already get a version of it, a free version of it with your TikTok account. And it should be a really good music service if you want to get people to pay extra for it. Uh, Nika, what do you think? You're going to jump on TikTok music? Um, Probably not because I rarely use TikTok itself. I see TikTok when it comes over to Twitter, but I think it's very useful in the fact that, again, these songs go viral and it's only these short clips and it's like, what's this song? What's this song? It sounds familiar, but I don't know exactly what it is. So the ease of being able to get to the song, that's the song of the moment from TikTok um, straight to uh, uh, a music source, I think that is probably uh, a bit of a game changer. But what I do wonder is, does this TikTok music, is it going to take away from sort of the organic nature that ha- that things happen on TikTok now, putting some structure mm-hmm. around it? Mm-hmm. Is that going to change people's, I guess, perspective or engagement with it being, quote unquote, official rather than just something that organically happens on the app? I kind of thought the same thing, Nika, is <laughs> TikTok is obviously banking on the fact that enough people are going to want and already do want the service. I mean, I'm one of those people. I hear songs on TikTok all the time where it's like, oh, I hear it more than several times to some, you know, dog video. And I'm like, Who, who's the song? Oh, it's Harry Styles. Okay. I didn't know that song already. Got it. Uh, it you know, I, I'm an old, so I don't always know Harry Styles uh, from the radio. But what's radio anymore? I think at the same time, it making it easier for TikTok users to make the most of popular songs 
maybe makes this whole thing feel a little less special. I'm not trying to be a naysayer here. I mean, TikTok is so wildly popular. It's like they don't need me to, you know, champion them uh, too much. But I wonder how much this kind of just becomes a, eh, everybody can do it. It's, it's, it's old hat at this point. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, that they're doing live streaming uh, as, as part of yeah. that trademark. Now, that may just be because they want to make sure they integrate it tightly with TikTok, which already does live streaming. But if they made it like the really easy way to do a DJ set, on TikTok music, something they already can kind of do on TikTok, but full songs aren't as licensed as the clips. I don't know. There's some interesting stuff they could do there. It's like a versus thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, it's time again for Teching While Black. This is a segment where Nika shines a light on a technology leader you might not have heard of yet, but is very important. And you'll be glad she told you all about. So Nika, who are we highlighting in this episode? So this uh, individual um, is quite interesting. He is Philip Ime Aguali. He is a mathematician, engineer, and computer scientist. So before we get to kind of where we are now, you have to go uh, back a little bit to kind of get the overall picture. Um, dubbed the name calculus by his schoolmates at 14 because he had mastered the subject of calculus that early. Nice. Even so much so that um, he outcalculated, you know, his teachers. Uh -huh. So he kind of got that nickname. So, you know, you have this, this young kid who's super smart, can pick up, you know, math, you know, without a whole lot of effort. But on the other side of that, um, due to uh, war conflict in his home country of Nigeria, his parents um, had eight other children and um, they just couldn't afford to continue to pay for his education because in um, most uh, African countries to get, you know, primary, elementary, you know, high school education, you have to pay for that. He had to ultimately drop out at around that same age he got dubbed the calculus, but he was able to continue self-study, which ultimately led him to immigrate to the U.S. at 17 on a scholarship to Oregon State University. So he gets to the States at 17. He ultimately earns not only a BS in mathematics, but he goes on to earn two additional master's and a PhD. So, you know, out of that initial you know, struggle, he goes on to, to get all of this additional education. Now, there are a couple of things that he is most noted for, and it's primarily in the supercomputing space. He's most known um, for his invention that is based on the study of bees. Now, you may think, how <laughs> is... Are bees going to yeah. relate to I usually run away from bees. This guy figured <laughs> right. out how to make a supercomputer off of that's amazing. Right. It's really, it's really fascinating. And that's the thing that really kind of drew me to this story is that he saw how inherently efficient the ways bees construct, you know, their hives and and how it works with the honeycomb. And he was able to determine just from seeing how bees naturally work, he was able to determine a way that computers could emulate that process and could be, you know, more efficient in computing. So in 1989, by using what he'd learned from emulating bees, the bees honeycomb construction, he designed and programmed um, the he designed the program and formula with the um, connection machine to use 65,000 processors to run the world's fastest computation, which ultimately performed 3.1 billion calculations per second. Now, I don't know how the mind works to get from B construction to <laughs> designing and formulating a program that runs the, the world's fastest comp computation. But ultimately, what he was able to design, the systems that he was able to design from this as a part of parallel computing is basically used in all search engines, Yahoo, for example. So it's one of those things where it's like, wow, that's how do we get here from from there? So yeah, that's yeah. one thing that was pretty fascinating to me um, on, on that front. But that's not all. He was also able to um, use his um, uh, 
this high, what is called a hyper ball computer that he designed. And this allows for the forecasting of long-term global patterns. So we go from supercomputing with bees over to forecasting um, global warming patterns. So the mind is a very interesting thing. And the way he was able to take you know, just real world things that you see and parlay this into something that we all use, you know, on a daily basis is is pretty fascinating. So um, to kind of wrap it up, in addition to this work that I've, 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 you know, kind of laid out that he did, this has earned him undoubtedly, uh, you know, awards, IEEE's Gordon Bell Prize, um, NSBE, which is the National Society of Black Engineers, their Distinguished Scientist Award, and um, there's one other thing I think on there that he was able to get from that that I cannot see. Uh, National I Technical think. Association's Computer yes. Scientist of the Year. Is it that one? Yes, that's the one. Okay. So, yeah, so that is. It's, it's, it's fun when you have so one. many accolades that <laughs> right. you're listing all like, of them. You're like, and there was another really cool there's one. There's another really good yeah. one. And those are just kind of the top three. But of course, obviously, with you know his skills and his background, there are other awards, but those are kind of like the, the big three. But yeah, B's. Uh, thanks Started to the bees, bees for inspiring Dr. Emmy Aguali. Uh, and, and thank you, Dr. Emmy Aguali. Uh, that, that's awesome. Thank and, you. and thank you, Nika, uh, for, for telling us about him. Uh, folks, if you have a thought about something on the show, but you don't know our email address, let me solve that. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Given the last quarter of tech earnings, it's not surprising to hear a lot of talk about belt tightening across the tech sector. Most companies aren't announcing layoffs. But they are announcing slowdown in hiring for open positions. Microsoft calls this a strategic realignment. Apple said it's being more deliberate with its hiring. And Meta is being more deliberate in recruitment. Yeah, so for the first two quarters of 2022 this year, Alphabet hasn't been exactly what you'd call cautious with hiring. In fact, 2022 has been its biggest hiring ever at least in, in terms of years, increasing its headcount 21% on the year in Q2 to over 174,000 employees. That is a not insignificant city. <laughs> but after lackluster earnings, the company announced, as, as some other companies have, it would slow down hiring through 2023. CEO Sundar Pichai is now asking employees to become more productive. Yeah, last Wednesday uh, at one of those uh, employee meetings, all hands meetings, uh, Pachai told employees, quote, there are real concerns that our productivity as a whole is not where it needs to be for the headcount we have. He added that employees could help, quote, create a culture that is more mission focused, more focused on our products, more customer focused. We should think about how we can minimize distractions and really raise the bar on both product excellence and productivity. So, which I did, what any good engineer might do to solve the problem. He launched a sprint. He called it <laughs> the Simplicity Sprint. Uh, it runs through August 15th, asking employees for their ideas. Example questions include, what would help you work with greater clarity and efficiency to serve our users and customers? Where should we remove speed bumps to get better results faster? How do we eliminate waste and stay entrepreneurial and focused as we grow? Uh, Nika, I know you have a familiarity with sprints. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in my work, uh, I am, you know, I've mentioned before, um, I am an engineer and the work that we do on the software side in conjunction with the hardware side, we run sprints for our work. Um, we do two week sprints. We have an overall kind of plan that's longer, you know, maybe eight to nine weeks. And then you kind of chop up that, that that bigger, you know, chunk into two week increments. So you can incrementally, you know, improve and, you know, get work done. Um, that's worked for us. You know, you have to refine and tweak things as necessary. Some things, you know, take a little bit longer, some things take a little bit shorter. So it's really, you know, as it, as it suggests a sprint, you run a short distance and then you kind of see what happens and you run another short uh, distance and kind of see how you get from there. But it's one of those things, this is a very interesting concept that he has. And I'm, I'm a little surprised that they don't already run, you know, that type of, um, I guess, uh, Program is not the right word, but I'm surprised that they don't run sprints uh, mm. 
already over there unless they do and I'm sure they run them on individual project, projects but it, it right. doesn't sound like they've done a lot on productivity and efficiency at least not company wide anyway right and that's very that's a very interesting concept how you can have it kind of at the micro level but not have it mm-hmm. you know at the broader level so that's that's interesting especially for a company that large and has been that large for quite a while yeah, what struck me as I, I don't want to say poor timing on Google's part because Google could not have predicted a pandemic where a bunch of people were working from home for the first time, maybe ever, having worked for the company. Uh, obviously, with almost two hundred thousand employees, Google has some remote working that has been done for a long time, quite a bit more over the last couple of years. So, with an e- economic downturn that's hitting large tech firms and small, but you know, certainly large tech firms have to deal with it as well. You know, for for uh, the person at the top saying, "Hey, we just want to know what you know you think could be better about the company," probably questions that should have been asked a long time ago. You're probably going to get a lot of people saying, "Well, I hate my boss, so <laughs> you need to do something about my boss because that person sucks." Uh, but uh, but but I think that, you know, it's so many folks are trying to get back into like the new normal and like, what's the new rhythm? And maybe I'm being optimistic here. Maybe you start getting some thinking outside the box stuff that people might not have been comfortable bringing up in the past. Yeah, I, you have to remember, at least the, this is the way I look at it. A Google is a is a money printing machine. It has been a money printing machine since the mid 2000s. When your company doesn't have to work as hard to make the money, which Google has not, uh, you don't focus on things. You can do things like 20% time. You can spend money on chefs in the house. You can you can be a little lavish. You don't have to count every penny. Uh, when the ad market starts to dry up, when you get more competition from other companies, when there's inflation, when there's a war, when there's COVID, when that profit margin starts to be attacked, it focuses the mind. Uh, and so, yeah, I agree with both of you. Like Google should have been looking at this a long time ago, but they didn't have to till now. Yeah, and now is right. the, the point when they're like, oh, you know what? We should probably milk a little more productivity out of each hour in these 174,000 people we have. Yeah. Now they're on the more of the reactive end rather than proactive. And you would think if you had that much you know, room ahead, you would kind of start to think about, you know what? This gravy train is probably not going to last forever. Even though we've had a good run, Mm -hmm. we should probably start to think about what could happen. And we've seen how long the pandemic has gone on. So you would think maybe kind of up front, they would say, hey, let's, we don't know where this is going to go. If we do, you know, try and get a little bit leaner, try and get a little bit smoother um, up front, then we can kind of head things off. And if it, if, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know how long it was going to last. And it's like, oh, if it only lasts three months, then, hey, we've given ourselves even more runway to to kind of run. So I'm surprised that they didn't, you know, give it a little bit more forethought in, in how they were going to make this work. Well, let's move on to, well, back to music, in fact, since we talked about it earlier in the show. K-pop stars Blackpink, very, very popular. If you don't know them, where have you been? I didn't know them until Tom and Eileen told me about them. But if you're a fan, I don't know them. AKA, well, you're going to find out, Nika. Uh, <laughs> if you're a fan, you might call yourself a blink because black pink. Get it? It's kind of cute. You're probably pretty pumped about their world tour, which starts in October. But black pink has also recently collaborated with Pub, uh, PUBG Mobile, which featured the group's first ever in-game concert, including a new video for a song called Ready for Love that takes place inside of the game's world, performed by virtual avatars of the band in a post-apocalyptic landscape, riding motorcycles across abandoned highways. Looks fun. You might say, well, hold on. Didn't Fortnite do this with some success? Travis Scott had a concert. Ariana Grande had a concert. And yeah, you're right. Riot also tried multiple vir- virtual music pro- projects inside Le- League of Legends with a K-pop group KDA, also the hip-hop group True Damage. Virtual influencer Michaela also debuted a music video at Lollapalooza. And PUBG's parent company, Crafton, is working on a virtual human of their own, a pop star named Anna. Blackpink's in-game concert called The Virtual ran over the two past weekends on PUBG Mobile. Uh, Tom feels very Coachella to me. Did you tune in? Yeah, I did. I I, I am a blink. Uh, and I jumped in there and uh, I took a look. It, it was short. 
uh, it was kind of fun. Uh, I think we're more excited about an actual album release date and an actual tour uh, than this. But it, it, it was interesting to to see, you know, the Avatar uh, representation. I think you're going to see that more often. Uh, and I, I think it was interesting to see PUBG try to get in on it, too, saying Fortnite's mm-hmm. been, been getting all the attention. Let's partner with arguably the second biggest K-pop group on the planet, uh, Blackpink, and, and get some attention on us. Well, thanks to everybody who writes in with lots of suggestions on what we should talk about. As Tom mentioned, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. Thank you in advance. And also thank you to Nika Monford for being with us today and, you know, bringing all the knowledge as usual. Nika, what's been going on in your world and where can people keep up? People can find me over on uh, Twitter at Tech Savvy Diva. Um, you can also, that's my handle pretty much everywhere on social media, but you can also check uh, me out on Snob Westcast, my podcast with Terrence Gaines, where we talk all things Apple and then some. Uh, so you can catch us on Wednesdays for our live recordings and Friday for our public show. Excellent. We also have some brand new bosses to thank. It's Monday. We had a good weekend. Andy, Jack, John, and Jeff all just started backing us on Patreon. So a big thanks to you, Andy, you, Jack, you, John, and you, Jeff. The new Fab Four. Thank you. Yeah. Andy and the Jays. <laughs> Andy and the Jays. <laughs> uh, nice speaking of <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, get, get it all together, guys. We'd like to see a dance by next week at the earliest. Patrons, stick around for our extended show. Good day, Internet. Just a reminder, you can catch this show live. We do it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back to it all again tomorrow to talk Risk 5 with John C. Dvorak. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>